Welcome and thank you for joining us today. My name is Cheryl Huggins Salomon. I am the chair of the advisory board for city and state, and I'm also the chief communications officer of the NYU McSilver Institute. It is an honor to host the 2021 virtual Above and Beyond Awards. There's no question that this past year has provided unprecedented challenges and changes for New Yorkers. We've seen chaos, strife, tragedy, and turmoil, a global pandemic, racial reckoning, political upheaval, and social rest. But the individuals we are recognizing today are some of the extraordinary women who are doing their part to make the world a bit, a bit better. And this is something we need right now more than ever. We're so excited to have our 40 above and beyond recipients joining us today, and we'll be recognizing each one of them individually later in the program. Before we start, I want to take this opportunity to thank our sponsors, CDW, Grand Street Settlement, the Brooklyn Hospital Center, Erie County Medical Center Corporation, Google, and Grant Associates. We wouldn't be able to make these events possible without you, so we thank you for your continued support. Next, please welcome one of our honorees, Kristen Mallet, Director of Business Diversity for CDW, and she's going to make some brief remarks. Hi, good evening. Thank you so much, Cheryl, for that warm introduction, and thank you so much to the city and state um, for hosting tonight and putting together this extraordinary uh, collection of, of women who are just trying to do their best and contribute um, you know, at a meaningful level. Um, for, for CDW, you know, I would, I will all be brief because I think there's so much to celebrate tonight and recognize, but not to um, be remiss of all the work that we have to move forward and what 2020, you know, can bring for all of us. So, you know, at CDW, we embed diversity and inclusion into the fiber of just about everything that we do. We want to ensure that all stakeholders have the resources to perform perform at their highest level. We understand New York's diversity is one of our biggest strengths as well. It's something we want to empower. We want to ensure we're bringing the minority women owned businesses, suppliers alongside with CDW to serve the city and state. Um, and, and we do that in collaboration. And so we have a lot of work to do. We are optimistic that we will all take off again in 2021, uh, better informed, better educated, and in more allyship. And so congratulations to everyone being honored um, this evening and thank you again for having us. Thanks, Kristen. Next, we have a treat from Grand Street Settlement. They've put together a video honoring these outstanding women who are being celebrated today. I'm Tracy Golden Gerson, and I've been on the board of Grand Street for over 20 years. During that time, I've served as the chair of the Early Childhood Committee and worked directly with Willing Chin Ma, Grand Street's Deputy Executive Director. During her time at Grand Street, Willing has transformed the agency, its culture, and the lives of thousands of New Yorkers. Willing was born in Hong Kong and raised in Lower Manhattan. Throughout her career, spanning 25 years, Willing has proven her devotion to New Yorkers and the field of social work. Her leadership has been recognized by the notable Women in Human Services Hall of Fame and the National Association of Social Workers Highest Award. Willing, we are so incredibly proud of you for all you have done for the families we serve. From babies to seniors, you have had a profound impact on New York City, and we congratulate you on this well-deserved honor. For those of you watching along, here's a quick video that shows exactly how Willing's leadership has made a difference for so many families. It's something that you hear about growing up, but you never think it could happen to you. I first became homeless when I was 25 years old. And we've been in the shelter for um, almost two years now. Being homeless and having a child, it's, it's scary. You question yourself. You also worry about, like, does he remember? Is he going to remember? 
once we were in the shelter, we needed to find work and childcare for my son. That's when I found out about Grand Street. So I enrolled Sean in Grand Street Child and Family Center. Having him in Grand Street, I know that he's safe. He's being watched, he's being fed, he's playing. I decided to go back to school. I'm now going for my bachelor's. I'm the breadwinner in my family. I do it for my son. Grand Street came up to me and, you know, they're active. I was interested in their parent intern program. I became a substitute teacher right across from Sean's school. Recently, I was promoted to assistant teacher and now I work full time. Because of Grand Street, I was able to take the necessary steps to take care of my family. Grand Street is great for seniors. Grand Street is the happiness in my life. Grand Street is family. Grand Street is my second home. Grand Street is a pathway for youth. Grand Street is a safe haven. Grand Street is an opportunity. Grand Street is love. Many thanks to Grand Street Settlement and um, congratulations to Willing Chin Ma. Next, we're going to move on to our keynote presentations. First, we will hear from Assembly Member Rodnice Bishat Ermelin of New York's 42nd Assembly District in Brooklyn. Welcome, Assembly Member Rodnice Bishat Ermelin. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you for having me. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, good evening. My, my name is Assemblymember Rodney Spichot Hermlin. I represent the 42nd Assembly District, which includes Flatbush, East Flatbush, Midwood, and Ditmas Park. I am also the first woman to chair the Brooklyn Democratic Party. It's an honor and a pleasure for me to join you today as we celebrate 40 fabulous women who are trailblazers in their areas of expertise. Our honorees today have made important contributions to society in the sectors of business, public service, media, nonprofits, and organized labor. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge and thank the people who made this event possible. City and state for giving women a platform here every year. Our female mayoral candidates, Catherine Garcia, Maya Wiley and Diane Morales, my fellow keynote presenter, council member, Carlina Rivera, who I shared the stage with last year as a recipient of the Above and Beyond Award. Cheryl Huggins Sal 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 Salomon, Chief Communications Officer at the McSilver Institute, and Kristen Malek, Director of Business Diversity at CDW. This is the 11th year City and State is hosting the Above and Beyond Awards. As mentioned last year, I was fortunate to be a recipient of the award and I'm even more fortunate this year to have the pleasure of welcoming our new award recipients. As women, we must lift one another. Making connections is a fundamental to succeeding in any of these sectors. This is Women History Month. And while we acknowledge women's achievements and contributions, it wasn't always that way. Women fought for their place in the society, starting with the right to vote. And as voting rights are under assault in Georgia and elsewhere across this, the nation, we must never lose sight of carrying on the struggles for which our forebears fought so hard. And today we have some major achievements to celebrate. This January, Kamala Harris became the first female vice president of the United States. And on Tuesday, President Joe Biden announced his intention to nominate three African-American women to fill federal circuit court vacancies, along with a host of other diverse nominees. And that's not all. In New York State Senate, Senator Majority Leader 
Andrea Stewart Cousins is the first woman and first woman of color to lead a majority conference in the legislature. Crystal People Stokes, our assembly majority leader just achieved an enormous victory yesterday, today, passing the Marijuana Tax Regulation Act. At the helm of our state is a female Lieutenant Governor, Kathy Hochul, and we are fortunate to have one of the top legal minds in the nation, Letitia James, as Attorney General. And let us not forget our Senator, Kirsten Gellibrand, who's also leading the way up in Washington. We also have three female New York City mayoral candidates and an unprecedented number of women running in local races. But while we have all these achievements to be proud of, we must also acknowledge that we, will, we still have a long way to go. Women, particularly women of color, make up the majority of America's essential workers, 52%. And in addition to bearing an overwhelming share of essential jobs, nearly 3 million women left the workforce during COVID-19. Women in our nation are still experiencing the effects of gender pay gap, being undervalued in their work and facing a disproportionate share of caregiving responsibilities. Although we have made a lot of progress over the years, there's a long road ahead. Since we came together last year for Above and Beyond, we lost a pioneer in the women's e equality movement that I feel I must acknowledge, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. While at, the L A while at the ACLU fighting for equal rights for women, Ginsburg played a role in 34 Supreme Court cases and won five of the six cases she argued before the court. She went on to become only the second woman to serve on the Supreme Court of the United States, where she is known as a tra trailblazer. Indeed, many of the liberties we enjoy today are thanks to the notorious RBG, whom Brooklyn recently paid tribute to with a statue I was honored to unveil at City Point. Justice Ginsburg famously said, my mother told me to be a lady, and for her, that meant be your own person be independent. As another personal inspiration, tonight I would like to share some lessons I've learned from my mentor, my hero, my mother, who recently passed after a lifetime of lifting up not only myself and my family, but countless of other people, immigrant women, who came to her for aid and guidance when there was nowhere else to turn. Like so many of our honorees tonight, my mom, Marie Andre Bichot believed in the American dream. She arrived in the US from Haiti in 1970 and worked in the hotel trades as a room attendant so that she could support me and my siblings. She used her sewing skills to start a small business selling wedding attire and other garments. The work was not glamorous, but my mother used it as a mechanism to lift up the people around her. She saved every dollar that she earned with those savings, she helped her other women and children find refuge. We don't often glamorize the people that keep our state moving. The hotel workers like my mother, the transit workers, the teachers, the nurses, and the nonprofit workers. But like my mother and many of our honorees who come from DC 37, 32 BJ, New York City District Council of Comforters and many more, they are often the unsung heroes of many people's lives. Many of you very likely learn not only through books, the internet and educational institutions, but through the practical example and experiences of your mothers, grandmothers, aunts, and sisters. And just as my mother passed them on to me and my family, I would like to share with you three major lessons I learned from her and have guided me, guided my life for, what, for which I will always be grateful. Lesson number one, empower yourself and never stop learning. As a Haitian immigrant, mom believed in the value of education. In our culture, we were taught to conte avec tout duetu, which means count using all of your fingers. This means being well-versed in many skills. Many people don't know that I had several careers before I entered public office. I was a math teacher, engineer, a Wall Street banker, and my education allowed me to find a place in all of these careers where women are still a minority, including in the state legislature. I am still not done learning. 
I'm now in law school at Brooklyn Law. And the broader your base, your knowledge, the more tools you'll have to succeed. Lesson number two, don't set limits. Self-doubt is entrenched in our society, particularly in women and girls. A Cornell University study shows that men tend to overestimate their abilities and performance, while women tend to underestimate both. Don't put boundaries on your capabilities. Make sure employers know, that, know what you can do for them to help meet their goals and boost their bottom line. Empower other women to succeed. My mother mentored many people in our community. One of the most important skills I learned from this is not to, to be afraid to ask for connections if you don't have them. Many women have helped me along the way, generously giving me their time, their wisdom. And I have tried to return the favor by mentoring and providing the knowledge I can do with women on the way up. Lesson number three, financial independence. As a woman, you will be in a better place if you can empower yourself financially. Financial knowledge is power. Historically, many women were denied financial independence, which restricted them from having meaningful control over their lives. And this remains true in many cases yet today. We must provide women the tools assimilated such knowledge, not only for their own advancement, but for the greater good that success would engender for their families and communities. My working as a seamstress, my mother working as a seamstress on the side, my mother managed to achieve financial freedom for herself, which allowed her and our family to immigrate to this country and achieve economic mobility, education, and a foundation for our futures. All this is why we take the time today to honor this year's outstanding group of award winners, women who have picked up the torch and are carrying forward, drawing on the examples of the past to forge a brighter future, truly going above and beyond. And it's never easy, which makes their determination and can do spirit all the more praiseworthy. Like my friends who are being honored today, Onita Carwood Mayers, Vice President of Miran Group, Tracy Brooks, partner of Shanka Rooster and Clark, Tiffany Caban, who's, running, who's um, running the National Organization of Working Family Party, Dana Corintanito Ruco, who works at the governor's office, Jennifer Richardson at Patrick B. Jenkins and Associates, India Sneed, who's my friend who works at GNT. I want to say that all of you and all of these other women are fabulous, dynamic women, and I thank you for your leadership. So I want to end today by thanking everyone here for con continuing to inspire and lift one another up as we aspire to a more equitable and fair city and state. Thank you so much and God bless you. Congratulations. Thank you, Assembly Member Bishat Ermelin. Please accept our condolences for your loss and thank you for letting us know about your mother's impact. And, uh, and also thank you for reminding us of leading women going above and beyond sheroes like Justice Ruth, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, as well as highlighting the challenges women face and sharing your life lessons, greatly appreciated. Now we will hear from our next keynote speaker. New York City Council Member Carlina Rivera of the Second Council District in Manhattan. Hello, everyone. Good evening. I'm Carlina Rivera. I'm the Council Member representing District 2 in Manhattan, which has some incredible neighborhoods on the east side. And first, I want to thank Assemblywoman Bashat for her words. And for mentioning her, her own mother, um, my, my mother's a, a proud Boricua coming from Puerto Rico to find her way uh, here in New York. And I know the influence and the impact that they've had in our lives and telling us to be strong and be kind and be shrewd. Um, you know, my mother raised us on her own in, in Section 8 housing, uh, growing up on supplemental food programs like WIC. And I remember she always told me to take pride in every job that I had, whether I was a camp counselor or a waitress or a director at a local nonprofit and, and even now as council member. And so I wanna thank uh, city and state for welcoming here 
welcoming me here to really speak um, on so many issues, but, but really to recognize the amazing women and the pride that they take in their own work and what they get up to do every single day to make this city a better place. And I'm so just honored to be here at, at this year's Above and Beyond Awards, uh, the virtual gala. And I, I was honored to receive this award last year, as was mentioned, along with a list of some other incredible New Yorkers. And I remember when I got the call, I was really thrilled, of course. And this was all you know, pre-pandemic officially. And I remember the day getting my picture taken for the article. And I hosted a breakfast that day with local housing organizations to discuss how the council can continue supporting tenant organizing throughout the city. Uh, after that, we prepared for a hearing that I was chairing. I'm the chair of the Committee on Hospitals and the City Council. And it was there that we would focus on the city's preparation for COVID-19 and really our own financial outlook and how ready we were to meet that moment. I would then have a meeting with the Department of Corrections to discuss the health care of people currently incarcerated. And then I would go on to record a bilingual, um, in English, Espanol, a PSA with HITN at the Navy Yard. And so I came back to around the City Hall neighborhood to get my picture taken. And then after that, I took uh, my staffer, one of my team members who was with me that day, I, I took him to have a beer on Stone Street. And I remember taking my heels off that day and thinking to myself, I have to stop having days like this. Um, but in the blink of an eye, I remember getting a call and you know everything was pretty much canceled, that there would be no event, that so many things would change for us. And all I can think now is, Dan, we never knew we had it so good. And so for the women on this list to persevere through all of the things that we've been through in the past year and to still be so incredibly strong and courageous and inspirational, I just wanna tell you congratulations and thank you. I mean, one of the best parts about that day though was I remember I came to the studio and I met two other people being honored. One was on their way out and then one would be on their way in when I was leaving. And I remember the camaraderie there, understanding what it took each of us in our own respective ways to get where we were. And to receive such a prestigious um, and touching acknowledgement from city and state of just what we do every day to make this city just a little bit better. And city and state was nice enough to, to let me back in today for a few minutes and, and what an absolute privilege to be here in celebration of 40 incredible women leaders in government, in labor, in advocacy, in politics, in healthcare, and in education. And when I look at this year's honorees, I know that you cannot keep our city down and that our future is bright. And thanks to these dynamic individuals, we have made undeniable progress in just a few short years. I remember when I first took office nearly four years ago, there were only 11 women serving in the city council. And in order to ensure equitable representation for all New Yorkers, my colleagues in the Women's Caucus and I we sat on more committees per member than our male counterparts. So it was a challenging lift. It required us to spend the majority of our time in hearings. But I think I speak for all of us from that time when I say we wouldn't have done it any differently. We did what we needed to do to ensure that women and non-binary New Yorkers had a voice in our city's politics. And since then, I've been relentless in, in pushing to get more women elected at every level and with a tremendous opportunity to bring in essentially a new class of council members, I'm doing the same this year and in, in my very intentional endorsements to bring us the parity. But I'm not alone. We have incredible organizations and, and people at this very event who are trying to make sure that we do have that parity of representation. We have organizations like 21 and 21 working to get 21 women elected to city council this year. And that goal is absolutely within reach. We also have an inspiring slate of women candidates running for mayor who we'll get to hear from later in this evening's program. And when we echo calls for representation, this is what we mean, proof of progress and proof that what we're fighting for is possible. We could have a woman running city hall for the first time in history. And after a year of immense hardship and 
lackluster leadership, there is nothing more affirming or more worth of celebration than the promise of a better, more equitable future. And this time last year, you know, New York was in the midst of its first shutdown with all of us working night and day to get the necessary remote infrastructure up and running to care for our communities. And as we've weathered this dual public health and economic crisis, women such as those we're honoring here this evening have shown up every single day to do the work to care for ourselves, our families, and our communities, even as factors have really jeopardized our stature in the workplace. But we all know that women make our city, state, and nation what it is. And we are already the primary caregivers, not just in our homes, but in our neighborhoods. We're civic association leaders, we're community board members, we're tenant leaders, we're vice president of the United States. And I am so proud of the undeniable progress that we have made, but I'm also cognizant of the immense challenges that we still face. As women, we are still told no at every turn. Women are barred from power by more than the metaphorical glass ceiling because every time it's shattered, it's rebuilt a few stories higher. And since I took office, I've fought for a more equitable city, state and nation where all have access to opportunities for a triumphant future regardless of gender. And one of the first things I did in council was pass legislation codifying sexual harassment as a form of discrimination. I passed a bill to strengthen the under-resourced sex victims division in the NYPD. And in the council, we've been able to set national precedent with legislation related to illegal hotels, being a new mother in the workplace, and even bicycle rights. And pushing along with my colleagues as chair of the Women's Caucus, we established the nation's first abortion access fund. And since then, I've advocated for reproductive justice that centers healthcare access for women, our LGBTQ plus community, and pregnant individuals in an effort to combat gender and racial biases in our health system. A lot of this work was done when we had a leader in Washington with an anti-immigrant, anti-feminist, uh, racist agenda. So local politics really, really can make a difference. And I really wanna thank city and state for recognizing a lot of us who are on the ground doing the work organizing who could eventually become elected officials. Regardless, I'm just so, so proud of this list of incredible people. And we have to continue to prioritize bold, unapologetic policy that paves the way for women to thrive. We need to eradicate the structural inequities that have allowed for a culture of sexual harassment, abuse, and intimidation to fester in the workplace. Last week, we commemorated Equal Pay Day to raise awareness for the 18 fewer cents on the dollar that women earn on average as compared to men you know, I participated I did my social media. I try to make sure I'm in touch with the organizations doing a lot of work around this. We've passed bills to increase transparency, to know what people really are doing behind closed doors. But the numbers are staggering. They are really, really disturbing. According to the National Women's Law Center, a woman just starting out in the workplace will earn 406000 760 less, $406,000 less over a 40 year career compared to men. For black women, this lifetime wage gap totals $964,400. And for Latina women, the losses exceed a million dollars. Women are paid less for the same work and so-called women's work is devalued simply because women are the ones doing it. We have to change that. Pay equity, paid family leave, paid leave for miscarriages, universal childcare, reproductive justice. We cannot relent in our fight for true gender equity because honestly, every issue is a gender issue. And in order to accomplish that for which we can no longer wait, we need leadership that looks like all of us. Leadership 
that's lived lives like ours. Women are and will continue to be instrumental and invaluable in building the equitable future our city, state, and nation deserve. And we deserve a future filled with those who are willing to go above and beyond in order to transform real world experience into substantive leadership that truly benefits all of us. I wanna thank all of the women that do this for every single New Yorker every day. And thank you to city and state and all of the hosts and all of the people that made this event possible. Congratulations and thank you. Thank you, Council Member Rivera for that view of what you're doing to improve life for women and everyone, as well as lifting up what other women leaders are doing in this city to make things happen. And also explaining why representation matters and bold unapologetic policy matters. So thank you. And I'm going to take this uh, moment to thank our sponsors once again. CDW, Grand Street Settlement, the Brooklyn Hospital Center, Erie County Medical Center Corporation, Google, and Grant Associates. All right now, so for the next portion of our event, this is gonna be a great opportunity to hear from some of our women candidates for New York City Mayor. We have a series of questions that we are asking each candidate. And first off, we will hear from Catherine Garcia. As a former commissioner of the New York City Department of Sanitation, Catherine was responsible for keeping New York City healthy, safe, and clean by collecting, recycling, and disposing of waste, cleaning streets and public spaces, and clearing snow and ice. While serving as sanitation commissioner, Catherine was also tapped as interim chair of NYCHA and to lead the city's lead prevention efforts. During the city's COVID-19 response, Catherine stood up Get Food NYC and was responsible for building a program of unprecedented scale, 130 million meals, to feed hungry and vulnerable New Yorkers and ensure a safe, reliable, and affordable food supply. She also formerly served as COO of the Department of Environmental Protection, where she made sure our drinking water was clean and she led the response to Hurricane Sandy as incident commander. Welcome, Catherine. It's good to have you here. I'm thrilled to be here. And I was thrilled to hear Councilmember Rivera speak so eloquently prior to me uh, about the importance of focusing on gender equity. Yes, yes. So um, we have a few questions. Um, I'm going to ask them to you one at a time, and these are the same questions that our other candidates have received as well. So this is a two-part question. It's about mentorship. Mm -hmm. Who has been a mentor in your personal life and why? And then if you could talk about who has been a professional mentor to you and why. Certainly. And I have to give credit to uh, my mother for really being a role model of a woman who was working and raising five kids at the same time. You know, three of us were adopted. Uh, so we grew up in a multiracial family, uh, but she really walked the walk uh, and showed me that I could do whatever it is I wanted to do uh, and was supportive when I was the girl who liked math. And I was like, you know, the girl who didn't want to play necessarily with the dolls and be the homemaker, uh, that I had ambition. Uh, and usually as young girls, we often are told not to be ambitious, to be more deferential to the men in the room. Uh, this was the exact opposite of what I learned at my uh, dinner table every night. It was the importance of standing up for yourself and absolute confidence in my ability to actually do whatever it is I wanted to do. Uh, she did push pretty hard on it needed to be mission driven. Uh, she was not necessarily like go make a lot of money. Uh, she wanted you to have a really uh, valued centered life. Uh, but she's like, if you wanna be president of the United States, 
you'll be president of the United States. Uh, I have complete confidence that you can get there. Um, and then in my professional life, I have been lucky enough uh, to work for some powerful women uh, who initially very early on in my career encouraged me. And so Emily Lloyd also brought me back in uh, to government. You know, I had actually been doing some work for her in the consulting world and brought me back into government, though I will say she did promise because I had two little kids at the time uh, that I would only have to work eight to four. And I would say that at DEP, I was like, what part of the clock are we talking? Like 8 p.m. to 4 a.m.? Like <laughs> it was uh, it was nonstop. <laughs> and she also gave like tough, you know, criticism, like, you know, tough feedback. Uh, like when you are leading people, you have to remember that you need to gain their trust uh, and that you have to make sure you are always an honest broker with them and understand that that is what it means to be a leader, uh, whether or not that you're in the private sector and the public sector. Uh, and willing to get your hands dirty and really dig in. Um, so I think I have been lucky uh, in both my personal and professional life to have had you know, strong women who were out there breaking glass ceilings and trying to balance it all in their lives. Thank you. So with all those um, wonderful mentors and strong um, leading women, um, what was the best piece of advice that you were given early on in your career? Uh, that you do belong there. Not to, not to feel like just because you're young or that you're female and the whole room is male, uh, that you don't belong there. That you actually have a valued point of view uh, and if you're in the room, you do belong there uh, and you can actually impact what the future looks like. Great, great. So I kind of want to flip it now and ask what advice you would give to women who are just starting their careers uh, in your sector. The, the, the first thing is you really need to be in it to win it. This is a sector like the sectors that I have been in have not had a lot of women in them. There are a tremendous amount of opportunities uh, that you should be taken advantage of. Uh, the other piece, and you know, this also goes back to you know, something the prior speakers talked about, uh, you need to actually stand up for yourself and also demand that you get work-life balance. Particularly as I've seen in the pandemic, the lines just are blurring more and more uh, between your personal and your professional life. Uh, women need to make sure they take care of themselves because they are usually busy, not only if you're in a team situation, taking care of the whole team at work and taking care of their family. Uh, you need to remember to take care of yourself because it's sort of like the airline. Uh, you should put your oxygen mask on first and then put it on the other person because you will be more effective. Uh, and so my piece of advice would be like, go hard, go strong, uh, and don't be afraid to fail. And if you do fail, fail fast. You know, it, there's always a learning experience, but don't stay in something that isn't working. Thank you, thank you. Well, you know what, I mean, you're certainly um, uh, a woman who's had a lot of hats on in your career. Uh, and um, I guess what we wanna know is, uh, what's one rule that you have in your life for juggling all of these areas at, at once that you're doing? Well, so there's, there's uh, I'm going to break this into two pieces. Sure. Uh, there is a personal one. And so the personal one is if my kids need me, mm -hmm. then I got to deal with that. Uh, luckily, they're old now, so they don't need me as much, but that also makes me sad. Uh, the second piece is that in your professional life, when you are having to do multiple different tasks all at the same time, uh, that you need to make sure you are spending the time to build teams so that you can get all of these different missions accomplished and investing in developing the team is so worth it in the long run. And particularly during, you know, states of emergency, which there have been a few, and I'm sure there will be more. Uh, that we cannot predict. If you do not make that investment, you end up always behind the curve. 
So those would be my two rules about how do you manage uh, large organizations with sometimes very different objectives at the same time, but then you got to make sure that uh, at least I need to know that I'm just taking care of the the little ones who are now big, because the other thing for the young women who are on this, they go, it goes by very fast. Yeah. <laughs> you turn around and suddenly you're like, how did my baby start say, talking about getting somebody a ring? What's happening? Oh, wow. Yeah. I'm not supposed yeah. to really know that. I found that out for my daughter, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I've just shared this with you. So, you know, it's out there in the public. Thank you. Well, um, we have a little bit of time for uh, a bonus question. And my question to you is, um, what's your advice to women who want to serve their communities or even run for office? Well, I, I would say that they need to run for office. The biggest change you can make is to be someone who is in elected office because it matters who's in that chair. Uh, it matters who is making the final call on are you opening the schools? Are you not opening the schools? Uh, you know, are you going to invest in maternal health care or are you not going to invest in maternal health care? Uh, so I would actually say uh, you should be running for elected office because you also should make sure you're getting paid for your service. <laughs> Women spend a lot of their time doing great things for their community. So I don't want to discourage that, but that is free labor. Um, and we are so accustomed to being givers, uh, that we manage the food pantries and we manage the church and we manage, uh, you know, everything in our civic organizations and we don't do it for any reimbursement just for the love of the job, which is great, but I'd rather have you in elected office making the changes you want to see. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for um, your, uh, your insights. Uh, and we appreciate your time that you've given us. Uh, thank you once again, Catherine Garcia. Thank you so much for having me and thank you to City and State. This has been great. Wonderful. So next, we are going to hear from Diane Morales former New York City public school teacher and former executive director of uh, and CEO of Phipps Neighborhoods. A mother of two children with learning differences, Diane sued the city's public school system to get the resources her daughter needed to learn effectively. Diane is the only former New York City public school teacher in this race, and that matters. She knows firsthand how segregated schools have divided young people based on race, income, and zip code. She is the former executive director of The Door, where she launched a street outreach program in the Christopher Street Pier for homeless LGBTQ plus youth that expanded to create a drop-in program for homeless youth and supportive housing development. She also established the strategic plan for what would become the Broom Street Academy, the first New York City public high school targeting homeless youth and foster care youth. Diane's remarks are pre-recorded because she couldn't join us in person, but she did want to participate in this forum. We'll listen to her answers now. I would say that my very first mentor was actually my grandmother. Uh, my grandmother came to New York City, to Brooklyn specifically, as a single mother uh, with a 12-year-old, a pre-adolescent daughter, um, didn't speak a word of English, um, and you know, took in other people's laundry to sort of make a living and make ends meet when she first got here. She also was the woman, the person who I shared my bedroom and my bed with until the day that I left home for college. Um, I don't know that I would have actually acknowledged or recognized at the time that she was a role model for me, but I know that I have drawn throughout my life as a single mother and as a first generation um, college graduate here, I've drawn from her strength, I've drawn from her perseverance, I've drawn from her, her integrity and from her dignity. Um, 
and generally from her bad assery because she overcame these tremendous odds in order to do what she thought was best for her daughter. Um, and that is deeply ingrained in me, um, not just in terms of doing what's best for my own children, but also recognizing that um, I should only want for other people's children the same things that I would want for my own. So um, that's been a tremendous influence in, in my life and my career. I've been quite blessed and privileged to benefit from quite a few mentors throughout the course of my professional career. Um, and I'm lucky enough to actually be in touch and in communication and have friendships, deep friendships with quite a few of them. But I think that the one that comes to mind most at this moment is the one who gave me the space to really push back and really argue for the things that I believed in and the things that I felt were right. Um, it gave me the space to grow. It gave me the space to get to know myself better. It gave me the space to um, know how to stand up for and articulate what I wanted to stand up for um, in a leadership space. And so those are skills that I carry with me to this very day and that I'm deeply grateful for. I think that one of the most impactful pieces of advice that I got early on was the notion of suspending disbelief. The idea that I should not let any of, my pos of the possibilities or my thinking actually to be confined by the way things have always been or um, all of the things that had been tried before and failed or just the negative sort of thinking with boundaries and limitations that keep us from being able to lean into our imagination and the possibilities. Um, I have taken that with me to this day. I carry that with me. Um, and I often invoke that phrase, suspend disbelief, when naysayers or um, you know, doubting Thomases uh, want to talk about things not being possible. Um, I am reminded of, and I often remind others, to, that we need to suspend disbelief in order to create new possibilities. One of the things I'd wanna to say to other women starting off their careers right now is that it's really important that we claim and take up the space that we deserve um, and that we not let others define for us who we can be, where we can be, or how we should be. Um, it is our time to be all that we can be and only we should determine or define what that is. So one of the roles I have for myself was I try to juggle all my roles on a daily basis um, is to actually try to compartmentalize as much as possible. It's not always possible, um, but when I am on the campaign, I try to be focused on being on the campaign. When I'm with the family, I try to focus on being with the family. Um, it's not always easy, um, but it is one of those things that helps to just sort of stay focused um, and maintain sanity. Um, and along those lines, I think one of the other things that I try to do is to give myself grace um, and to be patient with myself um, and to try to make sure that I'm giving myself enough time for me to um, regroup um, and to take a deep breath so that I can continue juggling and maintaining all of the roles that I take on in my life. And thank you to Diane Morales for her um, insights, for sharing those insights. And now we have some pre-recorded remarks from Maya Wiley, who also couldn't be here in person, but wanted to participate in this forum. Maya Wiley is the former counsel to the New York City mayor. As counsel, she delivered for New York City on civil and immigrant rights, women and minority-owned business contracts, 
universal broadband access, and more. After leaving City Hall, she held police accountable as chair of the Civilian Complaint Review Board and worked to improve public education as a co-chair of the School Diversity Task Force. At the new school, where she served as a university professor, Maya founded the Digital Equity Laboratory on universal and inclusive broadband. Let's listen to Maya now. Hi, I'm Maya Wiley, and I'm grateful to city and state for celebrating women in government. And I'm grateful to have served as the first black woman to be a counsel to a New York City mayor, and very grateful to be in the top tier of this race for New York City mayor, to be the 110th mayor of a city that has never elected a woman before, and we'll change that. But the questions are important. So the first question was, who was my personal mentor? And I have to say it was my mother, Retha Wiley, because she is a incredible leader in her own right, activist in her own right, really demonstrated an incredible combination of strength and power in terms of picking her own path being an activist and also a career woman at a time when women were not recognized as professional very often in the early late 60s, early 70s. But she was also an incredibly loving mother and an incredibly self-sacrificing one. And for me, she really led with humility, but also with power. And it was a really important modeling for me. And in my professional life, I was really honored to have as one of my earliest mentors in my professional life, Elaine Jones, who became the first woman to be the director counsel of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund that Thurgood Marshall founded and that I went to law school to work for, to walk in those big footprints that were Thurgood Marshall's. The footprints I found were Elaine Jones's. And one of the things that she taught me as a mentor was so many things. She taught me how to lobby Congress on access to health care. But more importantly, I think she taught me the incredible importance of generous leadership. Because I was a young lawyer. I was the access to health care lawyer. I was starting out in my career, barely out of law school, only three years out of law school. And I came to her with an idea because Bill Clinton was president and health care reform, a major transformation and our healthcare system was gonna be discussed. And here I was litigating to try to keep maternal and childcare beds in Harlem. But I went to her and said, I think the whole world may be about to change on healthcare. Shouldn't we be telling Congress what we want it to look like so it serves women who look like us and our communities? And, sh and I laid out a plan for her of what I thought we should be arguing for on the assumption that after I created the demands, she would be the one to carry them in Washington. And she had this amazing smile and this way of squinting one eye and, and kind of a crooked smile and a beautiful one. And she said, come with me, we're going to DC. And she, we, went, we got on that train, went to DC, met with Wade Henderson, who at the time was the head of the Washington office of the NAACP. And she, we go in, and she said nothing to me about what we're going to do. She said, tell him what you tell, told me. That was it. And I did, made the argument, said what I thought we should, figuring the two of them would now be going to the leadership conference and doing that, pushing that agenda and getting it into bills in Congress. And then we walked out, and she said, you did it. You convinced them. Now you stay, and you're going to fight for this through the leadership conference. And I spent eight months in D.C. realizing that this woman, this powerful woman, had just entrusted me with my own ideas and entrusted me with her mentorship to deliver. And I think the other question was, now I have to look and see what the other question was. The other question, I think, was, oh, yes. What advice do you give women who are starting early in this career? 
And I could tell you what advice I gave the young women when I was in City Hall as one of the most senior positioned women. I said, be audacious. Be yourself. But be humble. Because the truth is, no matter how long you work, you have to know that you have to listen and learn because you don't know it all. But the other thing, though, is you have to be audacious. That doesn't mean you can't do. And it doesn't mean you shouldn't demand recognition for what you can any more than you should be ashamed for what you need to learn. And as someone running for mayor, I have no problem telling folks I don't know everything because that's not the point. The point is to lead by bringing folks together and finding and sourcing the best ideas and elevating and lifting them up and pushing them forward in partnership. That's what I learned from Elaine Jones and from my mother. Okay, and the next question is, as a woman with many hats to wear on a daily basis, what is one role you have for juggling all areas of your life at once? Sleep. <laughs> we juggle so much. And you just have to do self-care. And for me, that means making sure I'm getting some sleep, eating right, exercising, and just remembering that there are other people who hold me as I'm trying to hold on to so, so much that I have to get done. And I'm grateful for that every single day and in every single way. Um, but caring for myself is definitely a big part of it. And thank you for listening. Be safe and well. Be audacious, but humble. We want to thank Maya Wiley. We want to thank Catherine Garcia. We want to thank Diane Morales uh, for their participation. Now, I also want to encourage everyone to vote in the upcoming election and educate yourself about ranked choice voting. We have many choices in this uh, mayoral election. And for the first time, we'll be able to choose and rank more than one. So please educate yourself. Now is the main event, during which I will read through a list of our 2021 20, above and beyond recipients in alphabetical order. Uh, please congratulate them in the chat and send your good wishes to all of our honorees. So uh, the slideshow presentation will begin. Deborah Archer, President of the American Civil Liberties Union. Olga Baez, Founder and Executive Director, Strive Higher Incorporated. Stephanie Baez, Vice President of Communications and Public Affairs for the Global Strategy Group. Paula Bailey, Executive Vice President, Grant Associates. Lisa Biatha, Director of Veteran Affairs, City University of New York. I feel like I have to like do a little clapping or something in between just to break things up, but everyone deserves this wonderful applause. So next we have M. Tracy Brooks, partner Schenker, Russo and Clark. Courtney Bryan, Executive Director, Center for Court Innovation. Tiffany Caban, National Political Organizer, Working Families Party. Connie Cahill, Managing Partner of Barclay Damon. Trantina Campbell, Director of Environmental Health and Safety Emergency Preparedness Coordinator, Richmond University Medical Center. Dana Caratanuto Rico, Deputy Secretary for Legislative Affairs and Policy, Office of Governor Andrew Cuomo. Susan Chin, Assistant Director of the Political Action and Legislation Department at District Council 37. Willing Chin Ma, 
Deputy Executive Director, Grand Street Settlement. Catherine Fisher Collins, Board Member, New York State Board of Regents. Onita Coward Mayers, Vice President, Miram Group. Lisa Daglian, Executive Director, Permanent Citizens Advisory Committee to the MTA. Elizabeth Dates, Executive Director, Strategic Initiatives, NYPD. Katie Gall Stiggy, President and CEO, Goodwill Industries of New York and Northern New Jersey. Marla Gale, Managing Director, Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill. Marcia Gordon, President and CEO, Business Council of Westchester. Vasantha Kondamudi, Executive Vice President and Chief Medical Officer, Brooklyn Hospital Center. Pamela Lee, Vice President of Operations, Erie County Medical Center Corporation. Kristen Malik, Director of Business Diversity at CDW. Melva M. Miller, Chief Executive Officer, Association for a Better New York. Angela Pinsky, Head of Government Affairs for Google New York. Dalvani Powell, President, United Probation Officers Association. Bianca Raj Perso, Associate Director of Government Relations for Davidoff, Hutcher, and Citron. Maureen Reedy, President and CEO, the Paley Center for Media. Jennifer Richardson, Jennifer Richardson, Senior Vice President, Patrick B. Jenkins and Associates. Tammy Rivera, Council Representative, New York City District Council of Carpenters. Laura Rossi, Executive Director, Westchester Community Foundation. Molly Sherman, Chief Operating Officer, Kivit. India Sneed, Associate, Greenberg Trare. Leslie Snyder, Leslie Snyder, Managing Partner, Snyder and Snyder. Amy Sugimori, Director of Research and Policy, 32BJ SEIU. Linda Temple, Executive Director of Development Disability Services, Hartshire Human Services of New York. Sarah Visengard, Partner, Harris Beach. Emily Whalen, Attorney at Law, Brown and Weinraub. Asia Worthy Davis, Executive Director of Public Affairs, New York City's Office of the Chief Medical Examiner. And lastly, Elizabeth Wynn, Executive Vice President, Health Economics and Finance for the Greater New York Hospital Association. Please, a round of congratulations to all of you who are honorees. We appreciate you. I'll let the comments catch up. There's so many, they're coming fast and furious and everyone uh, deserves to bask in them. Keep sending those congratulations. And in the meantime, I just wanna congratulate you for going above and beyond in all the work that you do. And if you'd like to share the word about your honor, um, check back on the event page um, for this uh, event at cityandstateny.com within the next 24 hours, where the video of this evening's proceedings will be posted. And to close out, I'd like to thank our sponsors once again, CDW, 
Grand Street Settlement, the Brooklyn Hospital Center, Erie County Medical Center Corporation, Google, and Grant Associates. Thank you, everyone. Good night.